Good evening and welcome to the meeting of the Economic Development Committee for February 3rd, 2021. The only item on the agenda tonight is to take up uh, bundle, two, bundle two tonight, Tom? Bundle two of the phase two zoning changes proposed. Our meeting is following the meeting of the Legislative Affairs Committee, which has discussed this topic in great detail. Um, so we will try to be brief and touch on new items. Uh, we'll say joining me tonight are Councillors Squalia, Dean Natalie, and Schultz. Uh, Councillor Fleming has taken ill and cannot make it tonight. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Skrowski and maybe you can, uh, we can go through and just see if there's anything new to discuss on each of the items. Um, absolutely. So I, I guess I'll just do a quick show of hands here. Thumbs up if you heard my presentation. Thumbs down if you didn't earlier. Um, I'm I'm seeing two thumbs, and the other three I guess I saw in person. So um, I won't do the whole presentation over again. Instead, I will um, simply stop at each point. Um, and I believe I got my screen shared here, but farmers markets, um, we had made a, a number of changes to that provision um, in the legislative affairs committee meeting. I'm not sure if there are additional amendments that are coming forward. I know there were some suggestions that new definitions would be brought forth by uh, Ann Yeagle of Growing Places, but that's the only one I can think of. All right, yeah, if, I think we can just go straight to the documents uh, for yep. each area. We've already seen the, the, your presentation, which is, don't get me wrong, is very nice, but. Um, I'm offended. So, so um, I, think, I think the way we'll handle this is we'll use the most recently adopted version by the Legislative Affairs as our base. And any changes we make will be from that, if that makes sense, Tom? Absolutely, yeah, I was just using it to remind me what order we are in. Okay, so we, we can start here, and if we have the um, the definitions, we can put them in. But uh, first, I, I see Councillor Squally has a, a comment. Yes, thank you. Um, so, you know, I watched the, the whole Legislative Affairs Committee. Uh, the main concern that I have with the farmer's market right now was the the proposal to, to change the threshold for uh, farmers, the requirement for, you know, to have a farmer's market that's 60% threshold when uh, the farmer's market advisory committee suggested 51%. Uh, so I'm concerned that that'll be too limiting um, uh, considering, you know, growing places and the farmer's market advisory committee who are the experts uh, suggested 51%. So I would just like to clarify if you know this 60%, if if it does include local makers or, or not, I, I couldn't understand that exactly um, uh, clear in in the meeting. What was decided? Uh, if if that 60% includes uh, farm produce and also includes local makers, like people that sell soap and people that sell bread and people that sell fudge and whatever it, it may be, then that would work. Um, but, you know, I, I've been uh, helping to manage the market for um, seven years now, and I can tell you that a big problem that we have sometimes is uh, a lack of, you know, getting vendors in, in general, but getting farm vendors can often be uh, difficult in different seasons. So uh, if, could you clarify that, Tom, what, what kind of transpired from, from the discussion in legislative affairs? Of course. So... Um, we have f two different types of products that would classify under the 60% farm products and then value added farm products and value added farm products would be, you know, and I, I hopefully you're seeing what I'm highlighting here, um, such as but not limited to baked goods, jams, jellies, preserved vegetables, fruits and beeswax candles. So they're processed from a producer They're In other words, they're taken from a farm and processed in some form. Um, so that would be the 60% would be value added farm products and farm products. The other 40% was to be determined and would, the intent was to include the artisans for lack of a better term. Um, you know, folks making um, handmade goods that are not either farm products or value added farm products, but are locally made. Uh, thank you, Mr. Skrowski. Uh, Councilor Schultz. I was just going to say, I mean, we had that discussion in the Council of Squalier uh, that, um, 
and I, I think Tom was the one that suggested maybe that you know the sixty percent might be a good figure. Um, and I don't I don't know about uh, Ann Yeagle if she disagree with that. I didn't hear that she did. I don't know if she's still here. Maybe she could weigh in. And I mean, it's only a, a it's only up by nine percentage points. I don't, I don't know if it's a if it's a big deal to her or not. I'm still here. Uh, yes, Ms. Yeager, would you like to comment? Sure, happy to. Um, I think what might be good is if the advisory committee take a statistical analysis over the past, let's say, three to four years since I've been at Growing Places and look and just see what those percentages have been and then report back so we're able to come up with um, what's really relevant to Fitchburg current so we don't cause any issues. Thank you. Um, one thing that does come to mind in looking at this is that this isn't a very easy thing to, to calculate off the cuff. Um, and the difference between 51 and 60 and 75% in the scheme of things could get lost in the rounding if you say have 10 vendors. Um, and I think the intent is to ensure that it is mostly farm products or value added farm products. So I, I think a, a simple threshold of over half is fine in my understanding. Um, if something more precise uh, is warranted, I'm, I'm open to that too. I, I, I don't know what the other members of the board feel, should we keep it as proposed right now to 60 or is it, does this warrant a change? I, I would personally um, be in favor of 51% as suggested by the advisory committee. I'm concerned 60% will be um, uh, limiting uh, unless we want to wait uh, for, uh, and as Ann Yeagle suggested, uh, you know, a statistical analysis because, you know, we, you know, we have one farmer's market and we have had one farmer's market. We don't want to limit it for that market for some desire to have something greater, I guess. Um, so what, whatever you be in favor of, um, uh, Chair Ben Hesinga. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, is it Councilor D'Antale? I'm sorry. I can't see you on my screen right now. No, no, that's okay. I didn't write a comment. Um, fr from a procedural perspective, I'm, I'm just spitballing here. Councilor Schultz and I were on the previous committee. Yes. And now we're in a different committee. And understanding that in this committee, some counselors who were not on the other committee may have disagreements with what the Legislative Affairs Committee agreed on, as we're seeing right now. I, I mean, I'm just thinking out loud with no disrespect to this committee or the other one that, I mean, part of me feels like this all should have been done through council as a whole, because how are we going to proceed this evening? Mm -hmm. What if this committee decided to contradict or, or change many of the proposals that the prior committee just did? And so we're going to end up issuing two different reports, one from legislative affairs, one from economic development with probably mostly the same changes, but changes beyond what they made, in some cases, disagreeing with them. And now we're going to have two conflicting reports of different amendments. I don't know how you reconcile that for a council as a whole meeting or when we have full council in March to vote on this entire package. So I was just thinking about that out loud when we were talking about this first item that people may have legitimate issues with what the committee just proposed in prior session. And now we may have different proposals here. Just made me think that having this in two separate committees, maybe this should have been done in one committee, but that's not for this board to decide. But I don't know how we're gonna, I guess, I'm, I, guess I leave it to you, Mr. I don't know how we're gonna handle this meeting in relation to the last meeting. And then for Tom, Tom's already documented all the changes. So are we gonna to have Tom go back now and document new different changes from the Economic Development Committee's perspective? I, just, I don't know how we're gonna conjoin this, if you will. I don't, I don't know how this is gonna work. I, I completely understand, Councillor. I think that is one of the challenges of having something this detailed referred to two separate committees. Um, I think procedurally, we do have to submit our own report. I think it does make as much sense to be as consistent as possible with the reports, but any differences will have to be resolved by the 
city council when they take up both reports, whether they choose to accept one. And, and that's another question, can they accept both reports? Do they have to accept one report and maybe edit it? Do they have to, and that's something, you know, our council president will have to give us some guidance on. Yeah. Um, but right now I, I think we can go through and if something we feel really warrants a change from what has been decided in the legislative affairs, we're entitled to make that change. Oh, yeah. um, but I think we do have to consider the the process and make sure it's it's worthwhile. Yeah, um, I mean, for, for, from where from where I sit, since I'm on both committees and yeah. I've approved all the amendments in the prior committee, I don't want it to be misconstrued that I'm going to vote. If I vote against these amendments, I, I'm kind of doing it because I've already approved the previous ones. So for me to not to approve different ones. From, from my standpoint, I'm contradicting myself on both counts. So if I vote against any proposed amendments or all proposed amendments, it's it's 99% because I've already approved the amendments in the first committee. So I, I don't really see a point of me going against what I already voted for in the other one. So I, I will say I, I would encourage all members to consider new discussion that's raised because we do have yes. new participants in the committee and that is a legitimate reason to to change your opinion. Yeah. I don't think anyone needs to be held to any decisions that have taken place in the previous committee meeting because we have dis different participants, different conversation, different evidence prevented, presented. Um, so I wouldn't be afraid of making a change if it's warranted or voting for a change. Um, but I, you don't necessarily have to either. Uh, Councilor Schultz. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, like Councilor Di Natalia, I'm on both committees too. And I mean, for us, we just spent three and a half hours making all these detailed changes and to, to, to have us actually go through all of these, uh, these changes again, it just, it seems like it's counterproductive. Um, as far as the, uh, the change there about the uh, 60, 40 or 51%, if, uh, Ann Yeagle is willing to do that statistical analysis. I'd be willing to accept whatever she comes up with as far as that percentage goes, because uh, I mean, it's uh, it seems it seems pretty arbitrary to me to to say seventy five percent or or sixty percent or sixty five percent, fifty one percent or whatever. It doesn't uh, I don't know. There just doesn't seem to be much behind it. But uh, I, I, that's why I'd, I'd be in favor of that statistical analysis if she's willing to do it. Okay, and I do have a comment from Ms. Yeagle um, saying, I think we will find it varies year to year and, a good, and good to be safe at 51%, adverse events should be taken into account. Um, one issue we have, so we can leave it as is, and if we have further information, we can make a change uh, later at council, if we would like to edit it there, if that, that's one possibility. Yeah, I like that. Okay. Um, Councilor Squally, did you want to talk or is... Oh, no, I was just going to clarify what you um, pointed out that Ann wrote in the chat. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, are there any other items that warrant further discussion in this section? No. All right. So um, do I have a motion to accept the changes as presented? Motion to accept the changes as presented. Do I have a second? Um, uh, to, to clarify, uh, the changes as presented pending um, new definitions from um, growing places and uh, a, a statistical analysis of um, the incentive. Well, right? we, ha we have to make our decision tonight on what the information we have before us. Um, if we get further information uh, regarding this percentage, we can make a change at council and um, edit it there if, if warranted. But tonight, our purpose is to have a recommendation regarding the proposal that is in front of us. So it's not something we can put off and come back to later. We can come back to it as a council as a whole as we hear the reports, but not to edit our report from the committee. And, and I, I would just add this committee process that we're going through is, is a step above and beyond what we're obligated to do through 40A um, for zoning changes. And you know, we've got a little uh, less than a month, just a day short of a month. March 2nd would be when the hearing happens, the actual zoning public hearing. So I think we could always flag these as items uh, awaiting further information from the Farmer's Market Advisory Board. Um, and then we could revisit that during discussion. 
um, as opposed to making a vote on it per se. All right, and um, uh, Ms. Karen did remind us that we had um, some new definitions to, to go in. Uh, do we have those available? That's what was being referred to. That's what Andy Eagle's gonna get to us. Okay, so we don't we don't have them today or now? Okay, so that's something we can um, address in, the, in the, 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 the public hearing in the council. Um, Councilor Dinatalia. Mr. Chairman, are we, are we, I don't know if this is a procedural matter, but are we, are we uh, discussing the proposed zoning ordinance changes predicated off of the prior committee meeting? Is that our foundation or are we looking at them as if that committee didn't take place? What I'm proposing is we take the latest version, which is following the legislative affairs. So that is our okay. new base. Okay. So what we can do is we can make changes to that version from yep. the legislative affairs, yep. or we can approve it as pro proposed by legislative affairs. Uh, no, understood. I, I, I don't, yeah. I don't mind making changes to legislative affairs. Yes. I mean, just, I didn't know what the foundation was. It's, it's what yeah. the prior committee approved. Correct. So okay. we, we, we do not have to go through and make all the same changes. We're going to start, start. Right. Okay. Okay, so the mo the motion is um, to just approve it as as is, and we might change it later. Or is the motion that we'll approve it as is, pending um, the flagged notation from Tom, um, awaiting um, information from the advisory committee. Or so yeah. the economic Com development committee will not meet again to um, debate these changes. We're just going to address them tonight. If there is further information that warrants a change, they can be made in the public hearing that's gonna be held by the entire council. So that is outside of this meeting. So this meeting is to make changes tonight and make a recommendation to the council. So a motion to approve the, the, the amended version before us this evening has come out of legislative affairs. Correct. So we, we have, does, would someone like to make that motion? Or that, that, that's, that, I'm making the motion, so. Second. Do we have a motion and a second? Yes. Um, is there any opposition? I'll vote uh, nay to that. Okay, we'll take a roll call vote then. Uh, Councilor Dinatale. Yes. Councilor Schultz. Yes. Councilor Squalia. Nay. And I am a yes. So farmer's market passes three to one. Okay, on to um, agriculture and, and related activities. I'll take any questions if you have them. Does anyone have any additional questions or concerns to the language adopted by the Legislative Affairs Committee? All right, D Councilor Dinatale. Just quickly, I, I was thinking about this act that we talked about in the last committee. Tom, it, was, the, was the law, why do I have 2.5 acres in my mind on this? Is, is that the minimum acreage required under state regulation? Five acres. Um, Five acres is? Uh, yeah. Four. Where am I getting two and a half? Why, why, why do I, I mean, maybe that was years ago. I don't know, but years ago it was two and a half because Possible. I see complaints all the time about uh, chickens being raised on properties, you know, for our farm fresh eggs. And I always had two and a half acres drilled into my head by Director Curry, but that was years ago. So maybe it, maybe it was increased. I don't, I don't recall, but um, I saw the five acres and I didn't know if that changed recently or. Uh, I, 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 not to my knowledge, at least not since okay. I've been here, which admittedly has not been that long. Okay. I mean, I'm talking like 10 years ago, this, this came up. So I, it's likely it changed within the last 10 years, but. I recall two and a half, but I'm all set. Thank you. All right. So do I have a motion to, uh, do I have a motion to approve the changes as proposed? I have a question. Okay. Councilor Squally. Um, is this, is this the um, area that we have the um, uh, container um, growing? Um, it is. It is. Did, did we, uh, in the last uh, meeting, 
did, was it confirmed that we removed the yes for the Fitchburg State University District and changed it to the planning board? Correct. Okay, I'm good. Would anyone like to make a motion? Motion, motion to accept. accept. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Is anyone in opposition? Then we approve it by unanimous consent. We move on to the next one. All right, multifamily housing development. Um, this was proposed to be held um, until more guidance can be given, differentiating four to eight units and anything above eight units. Okay. Um, I think that's fine if it's held for more discussion. Um, personally, I don't see any changes that would be warranted between the two types of uses. Um, I would be apt to keep it together, but maybe that's a discussion we should have with um, Council Zarela and then other parties. Maybe we can bring it back to for bundle three. Um, Councilor Squalia. Yes, um, I, I just had one question. Um, we're talking about multifamily development for four and more. This um, is, is this in addition to um, like a one to three or just a one to two and then it's three separately? Uh, right. Correct. The, the, zoning, the zoning uses uh, as uh, individually identify single family, two family, three family, and then multifamily is anything over a three family. So as you're, as you're seeing it here, it would basically create regulations for multifamily housing, this spot in the use table but then it would create a, a series of overarching design standards and guidance for any type of development above four units. Or four and above. Correct. And, and where did um, uh, the um, uh, suggested changes that uh, Councilor Van Hazinga made, um, like he said, uh, on, a, on a certain square foot lot, the requirements jump drastically was that taken up at legislative affairs? It, I think it wasn't because the entire section was being held for further comment. So I believe, Tom, is the process, is this gonna go into bundle three now? Do we just wrap it into that? I believe so. So what we'll do is we'll start over from the beginning and I will talk with the Tom and the planning board and maybe see if we can incorporate that earlier on. If okay. there's enough for that. So we, so for this, we will vote to um, hold it or send it to bundle three. Is that what we're gonna do with this one? Yeah, what I would recommend would be a motion to hold this for consideration in bundle three. So moved. Second. We move second, is anyone in opposition? I just wanted to make a comment, a clarification. Sure. I, I, I think uh, Councilor Squalia that during the Legislative Affairs Committee meeting that Councillor Zarella wanted to uh, break apart four to eight units versus larger than eight units. So yep. that was the, uh, that's why it was being held uh, in legislative affairs. Yep, I'm good with that. Okay. So if no one's in opposition, we'll take this by unanimous consent. All right. Next up, um, infill development. Sure. And I, I believe we can start that. Um, Ms. Karen would like to talk. Thank you, Councillor. Um, could you put up, Tom, the changes for that? Post? I had a difficult time understanding a little bit what Councillor Zarella was trying to get on on some of the um, after, on this next page regarding the ability to split lots down there, yes. So I was a little bit confused by that, but also again, it, the I think it's in, in conflict with the purpose by allowing the split in, in RB to allow an undersized, uh, pretty much like an oversized lot to then split off a piece to be used <laughs> to create a house. And it's not fair to those that are in that zone where the expectation is you have certain dimensional requirements and now you just have a little bit more and I understand like, well, if it's a separate lot, but it's still undersized, you're, you're able to do that. Um, but that's where the variance comes in. So there's already a means to be able to, to do that. The concern here is that there's no criteria here. It's almost arbitrary. Like just because you have it, it's allowed. 
we just have a purpose statement and it doesn't really fall into that purpose per se for our rehabilitation of not really having someone cut off like their lawn or a nice wooded area in order to be able to put a house in. So it's, it's, gonna, it's just harder because we are the yes, we are the permissible board um, in that regard. So it's gonna be challenging to say when someone can, cannot do it without additional criteria to kind of base that on because again, it doesn't really um, match up with the uh, purpose statement and the piece about the municipal piece, I was still kind of confused by that it was previously held by a municipality, um, like the city owned property. This is pretty much what the info was made for. It was like city owned property, demoed houses, small lots, what can we do with this? And also try to be able to use that for the side yard program. So that's the other piece too. Um, is trying to make sure we that's still like um, incorporated as the potential where you do have a large multifamily and to provide some parking with some undersized lot as well as another option. But, but I just wanted to say that that um, pretty much we struck the pony board recommended we strike the uh, you see F right there that really much allowed like a moving of a lot lines to create things because it was it really conferred that we really didn't want to see the creation of splitting or moving lot lines and things like that um, to create the infill piece that there's other means to be able to develop. Just Thank to you. Clear. But that's up to, you know, up to the committee, but I just wanted to, to mention that and that what that change might do. Thank you, Ms. Karen. I think let's, let's talk about, is it item D e or H down at the bottom? I, I can't tell the last one. Right. Um, so I, I guess let's take a closer look at this. And one question I have, and maybe Tom, you can help me or, or Ms. Karen. So if you have a 4,000 square foot lot that you own and ignore the, and you, you don't necessarily have common ownership with a, with a lot next door, but say you purchase a thousand square feet to assemble with your lot, would that qualify right now under the infill position uh, process? If the if this was stricken as recommended by the planning board, no. Okay, so the lot in order to qualify, and right now when the planning board runs right, there's a, a date setting it. Um, you would have to have the five thousand square feet. You could not assemble to the five thousand square feet at all. It, it within the rules and regs of the planning board, no. Okay, that's so, right. Uh, okay. Um, I think one problem I have with this last um, section is it's really, I could see a stronger argument if it was just someone who owned the, the 4,000 square foot lot could, you know, would purchase or assemble and gain. But if you, if it's held in common ownership, it, it, I don't think it really should, should do that. I, I have some hesitation there, but um, Councilor Schultz, you wanted to, to mention something. Yeah, I, I, uh... I didn't, I put up the, that I wanted to speak twice, but it's getting late. I only wanted to speak once. Uh, the, uh, yeah, when, when Councilor Zarella presented that, actually, I, I, I thought he had, he had a fairly good argument that, it, you know, if you own a 4,000 square foot uh, lot, I mean, you, you basically got a, a useless lot and, to, you know, to acquire that extra thousand feet so that it, it can be, that, that you can build on it and, and, actually add that to the tax rolls as a, as a property on that lot. I thought it was actually a good idea. I don't know, it, you know, with the, the wording, the verbiage, if you need to change it in order to, to, to make it uh, <clears throat> uh, something that the planning board can accept, but I, I, I really like the idea and that's why I voted in favor of that at, at, during the Legislative Affairs Committee meeting. Uh, Councilor Squalia. Thank you. Uh, um, I appreciate the, um, that, you know, what Councilor Schultz just said, that kind of viewpoint, um, but back to what um, Ms. Karen said, what is the, uh, the purpose statement uh, of the infill, um, you know, um, an ordinance that uh, this goes against? I don't um, know that purpose statement off the top of my head. So the purpose of the infill law provision is to facilitate the reuse of vacant, condemned, or substandard property within existing urban or blighted areas as single family dwelling units, to reduce vagrancy, litter, abandoned, or substandard structures, to lessen density and promote single family home ownership in urban areas, and to improve the neighborhood character. So really this 
provision is designed to allow development on little isolated small lots. When it's owned in, when it owned, it has common ownership with an adjacent um, lot. It's really just a part of the yard. It's it's making that property better by being attached to it. What this is intended to do is have those little islands that somebody owns that not, they can't do anything else to it. It's not owned by an adjacent property. It can't be used for parking for a neighboring building or anything like that. It's just there and abandoned because nobody wants it. And then it allows development on that lot. So I do agree with Ms. Karen that I think the that provision to allow creation or subdivision goes against the intent. I, I don't know if anyone else feels that way. So if we have a 4,000 square foot, say I, I have a 4,000 square foot uh, lot, um, does that's not an infill lot, right? No, it's, it, it's not an infill lot. And the 5,000 was chosen, I believe, as a sort of a minimum area that you could build, even if it's less than the, the uh, district zoning uh, requirements. Um, but if you own a 4,000 square foot lot and you also own a 10,000 square foot lot next to it, you really own a 14,000 square foot lot. That's what you have. Or if we change it, you own a 5,000 square foot lot that you can sell and put a house on and a 9,000 square foot lot. That would be what we would be doing? If well, we... with, with the changes, I, that might not be the most precise example it, because if it were a 9,000 and a 4,000, according to at least what Councilor Zarella put forth here, it wouldn't apply. But if you were left with a 10,000 square foot lot, which is it conforming under the existing zoning and a 5,000 square foot lot, then the um, concept you just put forth would, would apply under section E here. Okay, I'm not the expert in the, the planning department. Um, so I, I, would, I would defer to um, Chairwoman Karen on this personally. Um, I don't know what you guys think. Or what Councillor Ben has a good things, I guess. Uh, Councillor Giantelli. Well, uh, I'm not an expert either. And what's difficult for me is Ms. Karen runs the planning board, chairs it. She's been doing it for years. You got President Zarella, who's been on the ZBA for years. And you've got Mr. Chairman, who's on the planning board for years. So I'd love to have those three in a room together. And I, I'm I'm not that I don't have any opinion on this. It's just Paula made some good points. President Zarella made some good points. I don't know how I'm going to reconcile the two of them because I, they both make good points and they both know what they're talking about. And I could go either way. So again, this is very difficult for me. I, what Council Zarella proposed been earlier made a lot of sense. And now what Ms. Karen is saying makes a lot of sense. So now I'm in between a rock and a hard place because... They both know what they're talking about. So this is tough. So I don't know, Mr. Chairman, maybe you might be the final arbiter that sways me here because I don't, you also have a lot of experience with planning board matters as well. So, I, I mean, what's your, what, I, I guess you'll, you'll speak anyway, but I mean, what, what's, your, what's your take on this? My take is that I'm hesitant to allow this type of provision because it really leads to the assemblage and subdivision of, of land to allow this graded development. Because as I said earlier, the infill provision was really designed to allow development on those isolated underused lots that were a drag on the neighborhood. Where this has to be held in common ownership with an adjacent parcel, it really is just making an overqualified lot smaller to allow additional development. It's not, allowing a, a smaller lot to be taken care of by allowing an isolated lot to be taken care of. Um, I do have one question, maybe Tom, you could help me with this. Is there a mechanism to go through the Board of Appeals to achieve this aim? Or is, would this be the only way to do it? You could seek uh, a variance from, uh, from the Board of Appeals. So that's an alternative. I, and here, let me, let me try to be a, a separate arbiter. I was doing a GIS analysis while you all were talking, 
and I wanted to see how many parcels there were that were more than 4,000, but less than 5,000 square feet that are in the RB district, which is the only district in question. There are seven. Um, <laughs> so we could, we could talk about this at length at the end of the day, even if this is in here, it's not gonna change a whole lot. And again, mind you, one of those seven would have to be next to a parcel that's larger than 10,000 square feet and owned by the same person. I suspect that seven would become a zero. Okay, I, I, I think that's a, I think that's a very fair point to consider. And uh, I am impressed that you're able to pull up that kind of information so quickly. That's uh, very useful. The, the wonders of technology. So I, I guess, is this something we should keep in if it, in all likelihood, will never be used? I, I'll, I'll make a motion that we, we, we keep it as is, based on that information that Tom just gave us. I mean, I do recall President Zarell saying that it is extremely rare that it, something may come about, and Tom just pretty much confirmed that assessment. Well, we know of one right now. Right, well, that would be the Atlantic Ave one that's been hanging around. Uh, but that wouldn't be over 4,000 square feet, but uh, less than five. Yeah, it's 19,000 square feet. Then it's two separate lots now because they subdivided it, intending to do something with it. So now this 10 and nine, 10 and nine. But that would still it qualifies infill. Well, that's what this would make it qualify as infill. What this provision would do, and that wasn't the intent to split off a but lot it, to make it. But what it says here, an existing lot of under 5,000 square feet, but over 4,000 square feet. But so they're held in common ownership. But it's, so it's common ownership. And then you have technically the whole merger lot theory. I'm sorry, I can't see your screen anymore, Tom. Is it still sharing? Oh, there we go. Thank you. That and it increases density in a residential B in which it was the one of the purposes was to lessen the density. So it's also who in the re has a reasonable expectation of the of meeting the requirements of the zoning district of the, the uh, abutters of people live in the district. In order to change the variances, I look for lack of frontage and for lack of square footage for developable um, or potentially developable um, lots. Conversely, you could also lower the threshold for a residential B on the dimensions. I, I agree. I think the this section does motivate the in, increase in density in that people will be looking for lots they can break apart or combine to to allow for bigger development. So I guess one question is, is that a, a goal that we want to fulfill with this section? Mr. Chairman, if I mean, I, I don't know if was my motion seconded. The, the, I, I did not hear a second, but it was okay. it, it kind of your the end of your motion got cut off. We varied. So are you making I'm gonna, a, I'm gonna a motion? Pull it. I'm going to pull it because again, this is this is live here. I mean, I if we were to adopt what Chairwoman Karen is talking about, I mean, what would the what would the language be then? Or would we not make any of the proposed changes that legislative affairs did? I so, think we just strike E. I think yes. I think the proposal would be to to strike E, if that's what we wish to uh, to do. This is this is one of those items that I'm making a note of for when we all are together in council, because then Council Zarella will be there. And I mean, I, I'm I'm going to propose that we strike E. Second, and, and maybe that'll be that'll be a highlighted point in the council meeting, full council meeting where the two committee, maybe we need to make sure we identify tonight what the committee disagreed with the prior committee on 
that'll probably be the focus of our discussion when the full council meets. And so, I'll just highlight them all as reconciliation items. Right. So I, I'll propose we strike motion that we strike E and we'll force a discussion when full council comes on what, what the will of the council is at that point. Okay, so we have a motion in the second. Um, is anyone in opposition? No. We'll take that by unanimous consent. Were there any other items to address in this section? This piece here, the to insert language defining an existing undersized lot as one in existence at the time of enactment of this ordinance, um, provided that um, they may be granted a special permit as an infill lot by the planning board provided it passes through municipal ownership at a time subsequent to that date of enactment passed unanimously. So I think the intent here is to protect the city. So if the city somehow comes into ownership of a 5,000 square foot lot, it can then sell it as an infill lot. Is that a fair that's, assumption? That's part of it. The other part was to add a timestamp to what is an undersized lot to get around yeah. The, the item that if you guys are proposing to delete is a moot point in terms of the merging of lots held in common ownership. I think the timestamp still is warranted because um, you can still have subdivisions of, of lots and then it passes to different ownership and then someone comes forward at another time. Um, so I, I would be in support of maintaining that um, I do think the second part gets a little hazy in that does the, so I guess one question is if the city comes into possession of a lot and then wants to sell it, what if the city doesn't want it to be an infill lot? What if they would much rather it goes through the side yard program to benefit a, a, a neighboring property that needs it for parking or something like that? I think that was why it was added by um, Solicitor Pusateri that we may be um, granted a special permit as an infill lot um, by the planning board as opposed to. It. But I, I think what that leads is you have a speculator willing to buy that lot on the assumption that they can get a special permit. Because, I mean, can I'm assuming it's the planning board would issue the special permit. Could they deny because they'd rather it benefits a, a adjacent lot or be of greater benefit? Well, I would say that determination's made in the property sur surplus declaration that would come before that, right? So when we have a tax title parcel, that determination is made, should it be disposed of through the side yard program or through auction or through RFP? So the city would be able to make that determination um, and so were it to be disposed of through the side yard program, it, it would not be able to be used as a buildable lot. Would this be better structured as a separate item um, saying that basically um, lots create or lots sold by the municipality uh, or the, the city may determine whether or not they qualify at the time of sale or something like to that effect? Seems reasonable. Um, so is the proposed, the proposal of the subsequent part uh, provided that they may be granted a special permit as an infill by the planning board provided it passes through municipal ownership at the time subsequent to that date of enactment. Um, so I'm just trying to interpret it here <laughs> is, so if somebody, and now, well, ap after the act, it's enacted, subdivides a lot, and then the city becomes, takes it for purposes, then we can just allow it to be eligible for an infill, regardless of the, if it's so, at least 5,000 or more. So I guess the question is, does the planning board decide that it's a special permit process, or does the city decide that when they are selling it? I think his thought process here was it would be decided at disposition. 
So if someone creates lots, the city has it. So now there's multiple ones. If it's one lot, it's the same thing. It doesn't really matter, right? But if it's multiple lots, is it? Or is it? I'm not sure no, we're trying to solve right. for a, a problem that's going to be widely. Yeah, I, 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 I'm under the mind to just take out the second part of this um, amendment. I think it just complicates things. And I think it, I don't think it's that big a problem. And if the city takes possession of it, so through the side yard program. Um, I don't What's think that part, provided it passes? Yes, or provided that they, yes, that section. I would be apt to just eliminate that because I think it's, it just complicates things. I don't think it's very well set up to actually be effective. And I'm not quite sure about the problem it's trying to solve. I'm good to make that. I'd second if you motion. Okay. I'll motion it. We have a motion. Would anyone like care to second? Second. No I'll, second. I'll, sec I'll second it to drive the discussion during full council. Thank you. Thank that, you, that Council. May my, that may be my new motivation here in contradicting <laughs> votes to just say, here are the areas where the committees disagreed. Let's have fun at the council meeting. No, and I, and I think that's a fair response. Yeah. For the, so we have a, a motion in a second. Um, is anyone in opposition? All right. It's unanimous then. All right. So. So uh, if you want to highlight the second part is the reconciliation, right? The um, provided that they may be. Right, right. All right. Were there any other items in this section? All right, RC district, oh, oh, I sorry, think, you have to have a vote. Yeah, before we go on, uh, do I have a motion to approve the proposed changes as amended? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is anyone in opposition? Nope, we'll pass it by unanimous consent. I had uh, one question on this chart. Sure. Um, I was wondering why the the max height for the the, the RC non-single family is 40, but for single families 35. It was proposed by the board um, just suggesting that perhaps a multifamily would would need more max height, but not a single family. Just a little arbitrary or so yeah. if someone wanted to build a 36, 30, is it 36 or 35? It's a difference of four feet. Oh, so if someone wanted to build a 37 foot house for some reason, they just go to ZBA. Correct. Okay. I'm fine. The numbers actually come from its RC is presently 40 feet in height and the RC single family is matching the dimensional requirements of the FSU district exactly, which their height is 36 feet. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Karen. And would be but we're still remaining 40 feet for RC non single family. I just want to make sure I accurately conveyed the updates. That yes, I, I don't believe we made any change as of okay. now. Correct. This is what's not a change to the present RC. It's already 40. That's fine. But a change is made to the lot area. The frontage is the same. Front yard changes from 25 to 20. Side yard changes from 15 to 10. Rear yard changes from 30 to 20. Right. If there's no other items to discuss, I'd entertain a motion to um, accept the proposed changes. Motion to accept. Second. Anyone in opposition? All right. Approved uh, unanimously. Okay, accessory dwelling units. All right. Does so anyone have anybody anything to talk about here? Yes, I have uh, one, just one. Okay, Councilor Squally. I um, so I, I brought this um, 
uh, concern up of the 15% um, at the planning board. And um, I was just wondering if we, we added any clarifying language as to, to what, you know, that 15%, uh, the, the, gross, the gross floor space is, because, uh, you know, like um, um, Mr. Fontaine uh, mentioned, you know, different realtors might calculate gross floor space, uh, you know, including the attic and the basement, and some might only include the finished floor area. So I'm just wondering if there's a definition of that, if we change that. Right, sure. we added a, a clarifying clause here, increase in the habitable and non-habitable floor area, as opposed to a 15% increase in the gross floor space. So even from there, um, like, can I add uh, floor area of my attic? It would be non-habitable floor area in that in that sense. So so technically, I could add calculate in um, attic space, uh, crawl space, maybe basement. Like you could really get into it if you wanted, without specific definitions. Do you do you understand? Well, I, I will say that in the the assessor does keep a, a has, has has definitions of these types of areas. They're commonly referred to as the gross area and the net area. So the gross area is the total envelope of the building. You have includes basement, includes first, second, attic. The net area is the living area, and that's the portions of the house which are heated and habitable. So that would be your finished area. If you have unheated storage, such as a basement or an attic, it's not it's not included. So here it uses slightly different terms, habitable and non-habitable, but this is a different that difference that is recognized and defined and cataloged by the city. And and I would say, you know, a crawl space probably wouldn't apply no. unless you were to include increase the height. I think it's 70% needs to be at least seven feet, right? So there are this would also need to fit in with the building code as well for what would constitute, although currently a garage loft might not be habitable until you make it so, you need to make sure it's actually habitable as defined by the building code. So, no, I have yet. a question regarding that clarification because it seems to, re it really was meant about the external appearance of the structure, right. not really about changing about the 800 square feet inside the structure. You could use an attic space to make the apartment and make the accessory unit. It's not that you should already have it be habitable and then you can only go out 15% to get up to your 800 square feet. It's, you, it's trying to just keep it within the structure of the house. It was the outside of the house. You can't bug, bump out 15% more than what it is because the whole idea is to keep it in its present state to not look any different. So you could add your staircases and things like that. So this would pr potentially prevent someone from doing an attic or a basement accessory apartment. Just saying versus looking at it as just gross floor area. Well, what I, what I think it does is it encourages someone to use the existing space, like finishing an attic or finishing a walkout basement into an accessory area, because the fifty percent does it, it wouldn't be creating new construction. You'd be using the existing space. Yeah, but does like am I reading that wrong? Where four A is any accessory apartment shall not create more than fifteen percent in the habitable and non-habitable floor area. So meaning yes. you can't, so if your basement's non-habitable, then you can't bump, you can't actually develop more than 15% of the space. No, that's not what it's saying. What okay. it's saying is you can't add on to the building. So the habitable and non-habitable floor area is what is already existing. Okay. So it's saying you cannot make an addition of more than 15% to the building. So what it's doing is encouraging you to use existing space. And if you have to make a small addition to make it possible, you can. But what it's pushing you to use the existing attic or the existing basement or the existing loft over the attached garage. Okay. Because those areas are included in the habitable and non-habitable floor area. Well, I thank you for the discussion points because I that was, I guess, a confusing point for me too. <laughs> so I guess one question is, is this... Mm -hmm. We're talking this much about it. Is it clear enough, or do we have to do a little fine tuning to make that clearer? I, I think it, it would behoove us to reword it or add a clarifying statement. Personally, um, but if if 
the planning experts believe that it's um, it's acceptable as it is, then then I'm okay with that. But I, I know I'm confused and uh, I know I, I was confused and I, I feel like I could find loopholes all over this thing if I was really trying to get something pat rammed through the city, you know, if I'm, I don't know, you know what I mean? So I, I'll, I'll defer to you. Uh, would, would, it, would it make sense to add a clarifying of any accessory apartment new construction or addition to the existing building? Would that make it clear? Yeah, that would be much more clear. Because yeah, right, because right now I would almost think I can't go more than 50% of my existing house to make my apartment. But if it's any accessory new construction can't be more than 15%, that means I can, I can add uh, a bump out um, into my house or um, in order to accommodate having an accessory apartment, right? Right, in, in which case I would remove this then. And I would probably revert to the habitable, right? Because whatever you're adding is going to be habitable. Yes, so then I think you have to clarify that it's in reference to in addition to the existing building and not reuse of existing non-habitable space. Right, yes. We need to clarify that. So, habitable floor area of the existing structure. That doesn't. So any accessory part. In... New construction. How, how about starting from the beginning of the sentence? Um, any addition to the existing structure to create an accessory apartment yes. shall not add more than uh, or or should not create more than a 50 percent increase in the habitable yeah i think that would be any addition i think any addition rather than additional wow well, in this case, we might want to write and non-habitable because if I'm right now, my basement's not habitable. Um, but if I renovate my basement, then I'm adding like 600 square feet to my house. But my house is only 1,500 square feet. So yeah, I, I think you can leave the non-habitable floor area in. I don't think that necessarily needs to um, to be removed. I think it should. Yeah, it should stay when you're with this clarifying. Should we just go back to gross floor space at that point? It's a it's a clearer term. Or yeah, because it, it is something that's listed in I the assessor's record. Standard, right. Maybe change it to gross floor area, which is, is typically how it's um, written on the cards. Gross <clears throat> floor area. So any addition to the existing structure to create an accessory apartment, um, could we strike construction? So any addition to the existing structure to create an accessory apartment shall not create more than a 15% increase in the gross floor area of the existing structure. I think that works. How does everybody else feel? I like that. I, I like it. Make a motion to Amend as such. Second. Is anyone in opposition? All right, so we'll take it by unanimous consent. And that's item 4A. Did you want to write um, that it's reconciled? Well, yeah, I mean, I suppose so. I. I didn't see it necessarily conflicting with any, it, right. I, I had originally thought to add those in areas where it was in conflict with a new recommendation proposed, okay. um, but. But I think we should still identify them because we will have to figure out which version to pass along or right. which, which version actually goes in the ordinance. Right. All right, so are there any other items in this section that anyone would like to talk about? 
No. All right. Do I have a motion to approve the proposed changes as amended? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is anyone in opposition? All right, we'll pass that by unanimous consent. So we are now on to our last one off street parking. All right, so I think, um, I mean, my priority was the allowing for small scale residential development on Main Street. And that was something that was adopted by the Legislative Affairs Committee. I think, Tom, remind me, was it the consensus to add the, the footnote, much like the use table, was that it? Right, adding it, uh, asterisk here, putting the footnote here, having the um, principal use table comments, in other words, what's here be used as the formatting template, but not the substantive template. Um, what we're using then is up here, multifamily developments with frontage on Main Street with its intersections of Day and Academy, at, with, with its intersections at Day and Academy. That's just a typo on my part. Um, with six or fewer residential units are not required to provide off-street parking. And then it was suggested that my department in consultation with the advisory group and working group fine tune that zone before it goes to council for a vote on March 2nd. Okay, I, I think that works great. Um, um, these, yes. I'm sorry, multifamily developments with French on Main Street is between the intersections of Day and Academy? Yes, I believe it should be. But I think that's a definition that may be fine-tuned a bit. It's worth noting. Okay, I got it. Uh, and that was the, the six um, units that you mentioned? Uh... And, and that was a bit of a, an arbitrary number to try to define a small-scale residential use in those properties. Um, because I, I do think there is still, while there's still the uh, motivation to relax parking requirements in this area where there's more public parking available, a larger development probably warrants a closer look to just make sure it works, it's close enough to the parking and things like that. But when you just have a handful of units, um, I think it's something that can be readily accepted by the available parking. Okay. And this is a semantic change, but I just recommend we don't use multifamily. It's just it has mixed messages across if we just put residential developments the okay. same principle applies sure i think that's fine all right um Is do you think we need a, a motion to i'm sorry Councilor squalia uh, i'm uh councillor schultz uh, wrote that he wanted to speak oh i'm sorry Councilor schultz go go right ahead I think, believe you're still muted, sir. Yeah, <clears throat> what I what I was going to say, I know we we talked about day and the intersection of day and academy. Do we do we want to move it? I know Tom mentioned that we want to have the whole upper common area as part of that. Do we want to extend that up to Mechanic Street, or is that too far to go at this point? When I was looking at this, I originally had Mechanic Street in until I looked at the zoning map and saw that the um, CBD ended at Academy. And that's why I put it there. But if the plan is to um, extend the extent of the CBD to encompass the entire upper common, I think that's something that can be examined as we've discussed by the, the planning office um, to, to match what we're gonna do there. It, it's proposed to be extended to both the upper common and then going all the way to the BF Brown Fitchburg Arts community. I'd be amenable to um, uh, amending this um, to day and, and mechanic, Council Schultz. That makes sense to me. Um, would anyone care to second? I'll second it. All right. Is anyone in opposition? All right. So I just have one more um, comment on this whole parking from what I watched in legislative affairs. 
Okay, go ahead, Coach Foley. Um, uh, Tom, it was it was just a, a comment about being not applicable for municipal property parking spaces. Um, so, it, right. So what it what it really was getting to, Councillor Zarella's change that he proposed um, is for um, municipal property that it would not. Here we go. Um, municipal facilities was as determined by planning board and he had suggested that it should be NA. The thought process that he had uh, brought up is, is that the uh, a city appointed board shouldn't be in the business of designating municipal parking needs for the city. Uh, we shouldn't be regulating ourselves. But if, but if, it's, if it's not the planning board that um, kind of regulates the city, then and determines the best practice there, then who does? The project team putting forth the, you know, whether the city hall project team, the Crocker School project team, and what have you, um, and their respective building committee. Um, is that what it currently is, that there is no um, governing? The, plan, the planning board had oversight on on the parking plan um, related to City Hall, if uh, just as a point of sort of precedence. Yes, because we we did hold, um, or I believe, grant site plan approval for the project. Is that correct? That's correct. And it, but it's this still would mean that they don't have to. They can grant. They can they grant site plan approval, but they have no approval over the amount of parking spaces. It, that's questionable as to whether or not that would be a component of site plan approval. It, changing, changing this does not change the fact that items such as this would trigger site plan approval of the planning board. And the planning board does have a degree of oversight over these kind of questions. I think okay. it would still trigger site plan approval. It just wouldn't, we wouldn't, there would be no uh, threshold for, you know, number of parking spaces, but it's still about the, design and you know site distances and things like that and landscaping and whatnot potentially just site plan yeah it would it would definitely just, trigger site plan approval so i think the the difference is that the a, a judgment that um the a municipal property does not have enough parking spaces is not a warranted reason to deny the development of that infrastructure so how does that differ from the airport? Well, the the airport is a bit of a, you know, to some degree a moot point because these regulations would really only pertain to the construction or significant alteration to parking. Um, but if if we go down to the airport, it's basically added again to mirror the use table. It's, it's really an academic exercise more than anything. It says as determined by the planning board, um, but in practice, we're never gonna see this utilized in the near future. And I think it's also an important distinction that the municipal facilities are for use by the municipality. It's for the DPW offices, it's for the library, it's for the city hall. The airport, while it may be owned by the city, these facilities are for the use of other people largely these hangars that are rented out the you know if they're commercial properties a restaurant that's developed and i think that gets into a little different and i think a little more oversight by the planning board would be warranted okay we have the uh parking lot behind oliver and elm that's like a municipal lot it's not owned by it's owned by the city so i'm not sure if that would be a municipal facility but it's developing actually a parking area so that site plan review there is no set number of spaces that's needed but it's all about the circulation and fix and entries things like that and just as this is applicability for a site plan review so these are all the things that would apply and everything that was just listed would fall under one of these categories unless it's less than 500 gross square feet of floor area, which it's not. Okay. Are there any other items that anyone would like to discuss? All 
right. Do I have a motion to, or did we make any amendments to this one or is this still the same? And there was, yes, one. okay. Yep, there was, all right. Uh, would anyone care to make a motion to approve the proposed changes as amended? So moved. Seconded. Is anyone in opposition? Okay. Where is there? All right, is there anything else to discuss, Tom? Don't believe so. All right, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Thank you everyone, everyone very much for not only sending through this meeting, but the, the prior marathon meeting as well. And um, I think we have a good product at the end of it. And I hope you have a good night.